First things first, it's ad time, and man, do I have an exciting announcement this week. Beyond Solitaire is proudly sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations, and they have an awesome new initiative that just dropped. They are teaming up with Gen Con and with professional game designers to offer online courses about game design. Take one just for fun, or take three to get a certificate in applied game design from Central Michigan University and Gen Con. How cool is that? The first course, The Art of Game Crafting, for your classroom, boardroom, or game night, will be led by Aloy Santa of Third Eye Games and will run from May 24th to June 30th. It's designed to help you create your own role-playing games tailored to your own needs at work, home, or on game night. Check out the link in the show notes to learn more and maybe register for the class. Let's get on with the show. Liz here with a quick note before the show begins. Zoom was being very finicky when we recorded this episode, and there are moments where the audio is just not quite up to snuff. The episode is great. I'm super proud of what you're about to hear, but uh, be prepared for a little bit lower quality than usual. Sorry about that, everybody, but enjoy. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here on the pod with two special guests. One, you already know, we have Jason Perez from Shelf Stories. Yo, my peoples, what's up? Thank you for having me on, Liz. Absolutely. And then Jason and I are both super excited to talk to you at today's new guest. Uh, her name is Zoe Antoinette Eddy, and she is a professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and she is a researcher at Harvard University. And I'm just going to add all around badass, if you don't mind. How are you doing, Zoe? Hi, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. I'm also, you know, the reason I'm here, I'm also a LARPer. I was really, really excited to be able to... Uh, I don't know, go like geek first into a conversation versus pretending that I live a normal life (laughs) as as just an academic. So thank you both for having me. Really excited. This is a very safe space for the geeks. Yeah, Uh, yeah. This is, if you're gonna um, do a thing where it's like geek and also like 17 different degrees and the applying applied knowledge, this is the place to do it. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about, like, oh, I'm a Latin teacher, I'm a therapist, I'm a social worker. I was like, okay, great, great, awesome, yeah. cool. <laughs> so, um, well, one of the coolest things about your work, and one of the reasons you're here, is that your academic work kind of is at the intersection between anthropology, which is your area of study, and gaming. So do you want to give the people kind of a rundown of the sort of stuff you're working on, and maybe yeah. we can focus some specifics? Yeah, so I um, am sort of a jack of all trades, and we were talking a little bit about this, Liz, before we got going, but when I was in college, uh, I graduated in 2010, and I was an anthropologist, and anthropology was not, at the time, um, people didn't look at really gaming or hobbies or things like that in a serious way. I think there were, like, ethnographies of Star Trek, probably, at that point, because it's, like, apparently the only, like, hobby that people look at. But people weren't looking seriously at gaming. Um, So I kind of followed my other passion, which was indigenous studies. Um, And I did a lot of work in Japan, being, you know, a child of New England in 2010. uh, Japan was the place to go. Um, So, and I did a lot of work in Japan, but I myself am indigenous, I'm Anishinaabe. And I really started kind of looking at like, you know, how do people understand their identity in different spaces, particularly pop culture spaces. Um, And I went, I I graduated kind of by the skin of my teeth in 2010 and went to grad school at Harvard, where I did not have a good experience at any part of my my undergraduate or graduate education. But I was passionate about my work and looking at kind of like indigenous rights and history. And I survived it through LARPing uh, early on in my grad school career. I think maybe, maybe undergrad. I don't know. I'm, I'm, wow, I've been LARPing for a long time. One of my best friends said, hey, you should come to this thing with me. I was like, what's this thing? And he was like, it's like d and I was like, hey, okay, cool. And he's like, but you do it. Like it's, it's called LARPing. And I was like, no way, man, please. I, I, I have my limits, but I went to, uh, it's actually a name drop Rob Ciccolini's Madrigal Accelerate like ages ago. And I had a blast and it really became kind of like how I had my community. And I was there for like, cause I'm an anthropologist. I'm there for like two-ish years and I go, wow, like this, why is no one researching this? Like, why is no one researching this? This is so fascinating. Like people are, people are embodying experience and like they're playing and they're telling these complicated narratives and it's really adult and wow. And the, the honeymoon phase ended 
within about, I don't know, like two years when I realized that I was one of maybe like five native folks in the community. There are more now. There's like, it's just, it's New England is white anyways. Gaming hobbies are white anyways. And LARP is not particularly diverse. And I became very, very aware of issues of appropriation and race play. Um, and I was just fascinated by it because I, I talk a lot about how the appropriation of race and like playing at a different race is common in games. Like we don't even think about it. It's like it, and it's really kind of like baked into how a lot of games work, but in LARPing, it's so different because you really are physically playing that person. You're costuming as it, and you're thinking through physical manifestations of race or culture. Um, which is pretty, until recently, has really been unchecked. But for me as an Indigenous person, it was so wild because I'd go into a game and I wouldn't be playing a Native person. I wouldn't even, like, think of that in my character history. And I would have people, like, talk to me about, like, what it's like to be, like, it's usually, like, being, like, a Navajo person or, like, a Cherokee. It's never, like, you know, like, Anishinaabe hasn't become, like, cool until recently, I guess. But it was just so surreal to me um, that people were really playing at culture. And then I, I looked deeper into it and it's like you kind of like you look at all of these different um legacies of playing Indian or playing native or whatever and how thoroughly it's enmeshed in LARPing so I'm just I'm I really have like I I can go on a big long tear about how angry it makes me sometimes but like when it with my research is I'm just so fascinated by how people understand cultural identity, racial identity, uh, colonization through play, and that play is this really dynamic space. Um, and my sister, I should have actually, I don't know, she's going to be here in like two hours. I should have like, hey, pull my sister on. My sister is Samantha Eddy, uh, who's at um, College of the Holy Cross as a faculty member, also does this, but she looks at kind of capitalism and LARP and barriers to access. So we're, we're just like two LARPer nerds who want to talk about how important it is for the larger academic project uh in a nutshell i'm kind of like right. rambled but yeah now i'm inviting her next season all right so jason i know you're gonna have a question but i actually want to start mentioning holy cross when you think of it too um so you actually entered into this space as an anthropologist interested in studying the way that religions are created and expressed in LARP and as a religious person I just I like to know about these things so what did you at first get interested in seeing and then where was your flip because I think that that might be a, a good access point for people listening who aren't used to talking about things this way yeah so God, so I'm like a Jew. And if you can't see me on a podcast, I am a very white looking native person. I'm mixed. Um, so I, I, when I talk about white people, I'm also a white people, uh, mixed white. Um, but so I'm a Jew and I'm kind of like, I don't know, a very millennial person with religion where I really, really like the idea of religion, but I, I grew up, uh, with parents, I guess, traumatized by their, the different ways they were raised. And, I started as a religious studies scholar. I went into LARP and I was really like interested in how people made their own rituals and made communal rituals and like how powerful it was that people would have an in-game, um, an in-game church or an in-game god or goddess. And they would make up using kind of the materials, the, the games narrative gave them like these agreed upon rules. They would bring in like candles and like food and like you know, different fabrics representative of a god or goddess. And then at like 1 a.m. in the morning, they'd all get around together and like tell stories about the year they had had in some sort of like celebration. I was like, this is just so cool. Like, wow. I know. And I think from the outside, it sounds kind of like culty, but you get so, <laughs> the LARP, LARPing is a cult. We, we joke about this all the time. Um, <laughs> but it's it sounds so weird, but it's really powerful. It's like you just look at people making their own kind of like collaborative communal meaning where it flipped for me were shamans um is because people were doing all of this work to have like really dynamic like obviously informed by different world religions but really like unique things and then there were categories of shamans which and shamans were almost always um you know people non non probably a couple native people might have done but it's usually non-native people and usually white people uh, wearing like skulls on their head, like big furs and literally like banging drums, speaking to the ancestors. Like I have seen people like smudging sage, for instance. And I was just like, oh my God, what is this? 
So we went from like this really cool, like in one place, this really like cool, collaborative, uh, detail oriented, innovative way to approach religion. And then it was like, if you, you looked like left, it was suddenly people like in furs and buckskin sometimes. It was just like bad appropriations of, of kind of like <laughs> global indigeneity. And I was just kind of like, this really speaks to the marginalization, just not, not in LARPing or in just in gaming, but kind of like how culture has wrought the native, um, where there's just this idea of what clearly, clearly is appropriative. And a lot of people will kind of like comment when I talk about appropriation, um, that it's like, well, you know, everybody like all over the world, even though shaman may be a problematic term, we have like animistic people, we have ancestor worship all over the world, but in the American context, there's this flavor that is so clearly supposed to be inspired by Native American. And so I'm not really speaking to the European context. Your life is a whole different, whole different um, kettle of fish. But like looking at, um, it's so distinct as a Native person when you've grown up with this stuff and like it's part of your actual culture that you then go see at a LARP people kind of playing at powwow through this like shaman class. And that was when I was like, you know, it really sucks that this is such a beautiful space. And like, clearly I'm in love with LARP. I think it's a beautiful, a beautiful activity that really brings people together. Um, but it really sucks that this space isn't, isn't as dynamic and safe for all of us. And I started kind of meeting, I started talking about it. Um, and you can always kind of like pick other like native folks out in the crowd, especially if you're mixed. And like, so I have like, uh, most of us are mixed cause we're in new England, but we, we started talking and we're like, yeah, this is so weird. Um, it's, it's the great love story of me and my husband is he's like the other Ojibwe person. And I was like, are you native? And he was like, yeah, you are. I was like, yeah, these, these people suck, right? Yeah. Yeah. They suck. Uh, Sorry. It's, it's our love story. Um, and then we started a gaming company. Uh, but it, it just, it was really driven by a desire for, I, I want to understand why people do this partially. So people get why it's hurtful, not even that it's bad, but like why it's hurtful, but really just to show how larger issues of representation um, impact how people, how people understand the world around them. And this is when I talk about appropriation. I really think it's important that it's not bad. It's not evil. Um, it is something that people do. I do it like for, for years, like, you know, I was, I was a weeb. I loved Japan. <laughs> like I did not understand like issues of appropriation around like, Japanese culture, like as a non-Japanese person, that's like but one example. And I, I think that sometimes people, um, whenever we talk about cultural appropriation, they feel like they're being judged or it's bad. But like what it fascinates about like in my own life and in my research is that it's so informed by larger structures of narrative. Um, and unfortunately, those larger structures of narrative are grounded in racist, you know, 20th century, 19th century diatribes against Native people. And that's the problematic stuff, not people who are trying to um, experience something in good faith, I guess. Yeah, I think like the difference for me is you have the entire suite of, you know, Mexican food from all up and down, you know, uh, Tex-Mex and, you know, different places in Mexico and then Taco Bell. And yeah. it's like, if you only know Taco Bell and someone asks you, like, uh, do you know Mexican food? Yeah, I go to Taco Bell. Like, that's Mexican food. And, like, you know, like you mentioned Japanese, so like the entire suite of Japanese foods and, you know, they do all sorts of great stuff with fish, and vegetables and everything. And then it's like sushi roll. It's like, I know a sushi roll. And and so it's like, okay, uh, oh, this actually happened. Um, like, a, like, I'm a basketball fan. So Lin Sanity, you know, the Chinese basketball player who like lit the, lit the world on fire. They wanted to like celebrate his, uh, you know, like we're gonna, you know, Lin Sanity, everything. And like, we're gonna put fortune cookies in everything. Okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> Ben and Jerry, fortune cookie. Like, you know, Lin Sanity edition, it's a it's a vanilla ice with a fortune cookie in it. And so it's like, <laughs> no, I mean, really. And so like, what you're talking about is like in, in the American context, because they're very consumer driven, right? So like yeah. we put these things, like what you're describing, like the bear skin and the, 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 the skull, you can buy that. Yeah. And so yeah. it's like, like we, we take the parts of culture that we can buy. And that's what we, that's what comes in, you know, you, we reform that, right? So like, like that's what we are talking about in terms of the appropriation, like appropriation is literally taking, <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. right? And so we're taking the stuff that is takeable and reforming it into this like, this thing, 
right? So like that that that's what we mean by purpose. That's how I understand it. Uh, what I loved in your piece when 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 Liz link, linked it was like you talk about that process, but you also talk about how that is also part of the project of colonization itself. Mm-hmm. Like and perfectly nice people do it. It's New England. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we New England's full of nice people. Uh, we all wear our masks and we all do our things. But like when we engage in this what you call race play, not so there's this one part where it's like we're eating the taco, but we're not eating the real thing. And then another part is we're redoing colonization. So maybe talk a little bit about that piece. Yeah. So I think um, one of the things I'm talking about colonization is I'm working specifically from the context of settler colonialism, which like, you know, long story short is it's genocide and erasure through displacement. It's that you move indigenous people, native people. I also, I also flip between native and indigenous just for anybody listening. Um, But you remove indigenous people, indigenous communities from their actual land. And that's like the big thing with settler colonialism, it's displacement of land. But you also do that through culture and cultural appropriation is a way of taking and removing culture from the occupied population. And where the colonial project in games gets so complicated is settlers. um, And I say this as someone who is also of settler descent. And I I think that's important when I'm talking um, to remind people of, but settlers come in they have these conceptions of what the native is and where LARP is so weird is everybody is creating space. You're creating play space and imaginary space and they are taking things from the outside world, culture, and playing them there. And as a native person, it is such a surreal experience to have more space created for, you know, kind of pretend cultures, but then to see your actual culture taken in there when you know you're looking at a history of your your ancestors weren't allowed to practice their religion or were slaughtered or were put in residential schools or whatever and so it's this very um like when i talk about it i talk about it with almost this like sense of wonder because it's so weird to me and in my article um i think i start with kind of the the scene that was profound for me um which is i was at this game i try not to name names so i got to be good at that Uh, But I was at this game that was a modern New England survival horror sort of thing. And it was really good story writing and it was really interesting acting. And I went in um, because I just, I'd heard really good things and a couple of my friends were playing. I went in kind of not knowing that much about it. And I was not playing a native character uh, because I I didn't think to, I guess. And that's kind of an interesting, an interesting line here. But I didn't realize that apparently the game had like these complicated, it took place on a reservation of a made up tribe uh, to get around what I think the GM thought were tribal sovereignty laws, which uh, did not understand tribal sovereignty laws. But it was like this interesting kind of like political thing they were trying to do. I didn't realize that because it was very secret. Um, But I went in and there were all of these white non-native people uh, playing tribal elders, and I had no idea what was going on. Um, what was also weird was there were like more native people at this game, weirdly than other games. But I went up to the table, so there's a bunch of like NPCs, non-player characters are like talking to each other, and they're having like a council meeting. And they look at me and they say like, "No outsiders." And it was this really, it was so weird, and I'm just like. My like jaw dropped and there were two actually native guys at the table who were also playing native people. Um, and they saw me and like, I just walked away and I went to my friend. I was like, what the fuck? What you, what, what, how did, how, how did, what? And it, it was this like a moment for me of like, you know, the, the two actual native guys came over and like checked in. I was like, this isn't cool. Like what, what, I, I what? what and it was kind of like you know my one of my black friends was laughing at me she's like oh you understand get out now well not really like you'll be fine but like it's like it it was that kind of like moment of was I really just told am I not native enough in my play so like real native me didn't ascribe to like playing native so I'm not native enough to be sitting at the table with people it was so weird um and I, I you know I'm like writerly and articulate about this in the article but it it is this this feeling of like displacement and erasure on a very powerful level, because it's like, even in your fictional life, you can be erased. And I have so many, so many friends of color um, in LARP that we all talk about this. And like, I I can't speak to kind of um, 
the non-native BIPOC experience, but we've all talked about how LARP should be this space where we're all held, but it becomes kind of like advancements of a colonial project or the white supremacy project or whatever, because it is grounded in fantasy and fiction that's built on these larger racist projects. Actually, I want to go to that part because as you were discussing this, one of the stories that interested me, so everybody who's listening, I'm going to link this uh, article in the show notes so you can go look, but um, so I covered a few different people under, I'm assuming some pseudonyms that you made for them, yeah. um, <laughs> but one of them was named Willow and she dressed, she was basically doing Galadriel cosplay and she wanted to kind of really get into the pain of her half human half elf heritage and talk about feeling like she didn't belong anywhere while being a standard white girl like i could put my north face and uggs on and go to starbucks and we would just both be there (laughs) And, and i guess i wanted to ask about you know so how, I mean, first of all, I think it's important for people to understand how that feels. So it's worth revisiting. But also I, I thought it would, I want maybe to, for you to expand on how that appears in the guise of, oh, it's just elves. It's just elves. Um, yeah. We like to think of it as something else. This has nothing to do with reality, but it does. So how does it? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of things. And it's like, so the Willow, the Willow experience. So all of the, like the stories I have, some are, they're based on very specific people, but they're mostly composites because I've seen these. So they're representative composites of things um, that you experience in LARP. Uh, elves are very common. And I think like actually black scholars have done a much better job talking about Tolkien and elves and orcs and this idea of like master races and, you know, the beautiful white people and <laughs> the like savage dark other What's fascinating about elves is um, particularly in kind of more of like, I don't know, the legacy of D&D and role-playing games is elves have become this stand-in for some sort of other. And some sort of, sometimes that other is like this Galadriel um, kind of Lord of the Rings, beautiful kind of fair-skinned person. But just as frequently now, elves are wild they're just they're associated with the wild or with nature and they're very like nature loving they've usually been replaced by humans and regardless of complexion or race or whoever they're described is it's it's usually the avatar thing right where they are the lorax they speak for the trees and uh whatever the colonial force has come in and doesn't understand like you know what they've done to nature and they really in the u.s they tend to really take on a lot of this noble savage stuff. When I talk about the noble savage, it's the idea that if you are a native person, you are deeply connected to, you know, you are the Lorax, you speak for the trees. I call it like Lorax. Uh, uh, the Lorax imaginary of, I don't know, native whatever. Almost almost onto something there. But, um, and, and I'd be fascinating to see it not in the American context, but in the American context, it often feels very like a native American, particularly when people start kind of dressing like tends towards like like you guys like always just go for the fringed buckskin skirt stuff I don't know why but with um the example of willow the other thing that happens is so people play elves and I've kind of got like whatever these are fantasy races we need to understand um how they're products of colonial thought and one of the big ways you can look at that is people will often play my father was an elf or my, my mother was an elf, my father was a human. And uh, lo, I am the tragedy who is, who is locked out of both worlds and um, wants to bring them together and is kind of like a mediator. And that's so common is when you have this sort of like the fantasy of mixed race birth. And to me, it's really challenging because it's like you watch someone sort of articulate your own experience as a mixed person. And like for most native people, that is the story, right? Like it, many, many, many of us are are mixed. And um, you watch people kind of get caught up in the romance of your, the complications of your birth. And I'm not talking about like kind of my birth, my mom and my dad, but I look at like, you know, my grandparents and things like that. And like what it's like to be a mixed person. Um, and I think anybody who's mixed can speak to that, but it's, it's really, really, strange and jarring to listen to people talk about how tragic it is and talk about how tragic it is to you and perform your own experience in a way that is still not particularly nuanced to what it's actually like to go through. Um, My sister had this 
surreal experience at a game. I keep saying surreal because it feels that way. My sister is much less uh, white looking than I am. And she's very clearly mixed. Um, but my sister was at a game, um, one of mine actually, and we tried to bring in like, you could play mixed heritage. It was okay. We got rid of the we got rid of the construction of race insofar as you can, but we had fantasy uh, heritages and you could combine those heritages. And it was because we have so many mixed players that come to our games. And my sister didn't really want to talk about being a mixed person because she talks about it every day of her life. Um, and she, uh, that's what it does. And she, so she didn't, but she had, there was this encounter that she was having with another player that was like really dynamic and they had cool tension and, um, it, it turned into kind of a fight and the player said to her, like, you don't understand what it's like to be from this culture and this culture. It changes your perspective on the world. And my sister just like put her hands up in the air, took a step back and went, whoa, need to take a step back. And the other player to their credit immediately was like, oh my God, I can't believe I just said that to you. Uh, are we, are we cool? And Sammy, my sister was just like, we are cool. It's cool. Um, just let's, let's tone this back. And it was my sister and I talked about it at a game um, after game. Cause you know, I wrote this idea of like mixed heritage cause I thought it would be cool. And I was like, yeah, and here are the dangers of, of race play is like, you know, like we look at this and it's so, it's really dragged to have other people play your experience. And I have, um, you know, I have a lot of friends right now. This is kind of like a wild, a wild jump but who are like trans and they'll talk about how people are now because you can play with gender at LARP it's one of the cool parts at LARP but like it can be really weird for them when they have like cisgender friends who are playing trans characters and appropriating that experience because you're having your own hardship uh performed at you and it's kind of part of this larger there's so much we look at like you know Hollywood and there's so much conversation about like don't have cisgender actors um, play trans parts. Don't have uh, non-native people play native parts. And we're seeing that like in LARP. Um, that's going in like a wild direction. But yeah, we can get back to elves too. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. But it's it's part of this kind of like um, this larger thing of there are these different signposts in the LARP landscape where people can sort of affix themselves to problematic play. So as soon as like you're playing an elf and you're playing an elf and in your 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 mind you're like yeah and my mother was the was the Sacagawea of the elf people basically and my father and it's like it gets so bad it's like cringy but like I'll sit here and listen to people be like yep yeah, my mother was an elf and she was the translator for the brave adventurers who came and they fell in love and she was swept off her feet and I'm like well I know like my great grandmother I think was thirteen when she got married. So uh, to a white fur trader, it's, it's not that romantic. And also just, this is weird. Like, this is weird. Um, yeah, so it's strange. It's, it's a, again, why I think like, I, I really encourage more people to study LARP and not just like, uh, not just study LARP in terms of like, oh, look, live action role play. This is what they do, isn't it? But like actually get into it because it's, there's so much going on. Yeah. It's a good way to approach this question. So. I mean, I'm trying to think of it from the perspective of a LARPer, you know, and, and you know, a nice, white, regular LARPer who doesn't know anything, right? I mean, they, they, this is a whole different, and I get that, I, I, I've been doing this for uh, a couple of years now, doing videos on this stuff, and I get comments all over the place, but I, blah, dot, 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 you know, uh, and, you know, all this cultural stuff is very whatever. Uh, so I, I'm wondering, I want to bounce something off you, I want to hear your, your take. So it's like, we talk about, you know, and I'm a Puerto Rican, right? And uh, I know I, I've studied into uh, Taino stuff. So, uh, so like, you know, how we were decimated, the first uh, tribe that was decimated a colonization. Uh, and so, yeah, so like, you know, I, I try to I speak from this, you know, as much from my personal experience as possible. So it's like, okay, we talk about colonization and the impact that it's had on us as peoples, how our land was taken and our culture was taken and our resources were taken and like we live with it kind of on this thing every every single every minute of every day there's like a in the back of our minds is like an awareness and it's yeah. like a, a, a like a slow level adrenaline response we walk through every single day kind of like well you know i have less than i i could have if, in, in this world yeah. right so like that's a that's a social thing but then translated into the larp world when a, the nice larper does it they interpret it individualistically yeah, like my, my self-actualization has been harmed by, uh, you know, 
uh, I can't realize my own personal full self because I'm this mixed race person. And I, and my journey is to realize my own personal uh, self-actualization. So like the trans, the, the, the disjunction being that for a native person, the, the, it's very global and communal and world encompassing. And then in the LARPer's hands, it's an individualistic journey. Yeah. Is that a, a, a way to think about how, where that disjunction comes from? That's so fascinating. I'm kind of chewing on that for a second because that's such a good way to think about it. Um, yeah, and it's, I so I always kind of look at this from like a pop culture perspective too, is like how does pop culture um, inform it? But one of the things, um, this idea of sort of like, LARP is like fundamentally individualistic. Like it's, it's, it's a narcissistic exercise. Like I said, this is like a person with narcissistic tendencies. It's a narcissistic exercise because you're, you're, you're important, right? You're writing a story where you are somehow important and you're bringing it to the community. And like why I think LARPing is so popular with so many people is it's people who don't, and it sounds cliche, but they feel like they don't necessarily have a community. They bring their important story to a group and they become this big group community built on stories and they feel like they have it. And um, what's, you know, I, I feel pretty, um, I feel pretty supported by my native community outside of LARP. Like I have like a, a rich group of people from, you know, my kind of tribal affiliation to not my tribal affiliation, uh, where we talk and we think about the, like, our life as Indigenous people. Um, you know, if I have questions on cultural stuff, there's someone I can go talk to. And it's not something um, that I had ever really considered bringing individualistically into a LARP setting, kind of like to your point. But <laughs> we're kind of like where that turned around is I realized that um, we could, and it could be really neat if there were more like Native people to get <laughs> together and do it. Um, but I think that is part of it is like people are so people um, take LARPing so personally, any sort of game, any sort of creative activity where people are, are told they're being appropriative or inappropriate or whatever. They take it so personally because it's vulnerable. Right. And this is the biggest thing I have found is people, when they write their character histories, they put together their costume and they bring it into a space are doing something profoundly vulnerable. And that profoundly vulnerable thing may be quite racist and they may not, the vast majority of LARPers have no idea that what they're doing is appropriative. Um, but like when you call them on it and it's like, I'm learning to be more gentle when I try to call people in because it is, the creative exercise is one of great vulnerability and intimacy and people get very defensive of it. Uh, kind of long story short, I do too. Like I've done, I've done problematic shit and uh, I get very defensive of it. I think of it like, you know, you're in the suburbs, right? And you want to have different experiences, but you can only go so far because you've only had different experiences. You have your bike. You can't, you can't fly anywhere. So like on your bike, where can I go? I can only go to the strip mall. I can only go to the Taco Bell and the Tucci bar. And like, this is what I know. So like, if I want to get out of my home, which may be oppressive in my own, you know, oppresses me in my own mm -hmm. ways. My parents don't understand me. And, you know, my school is annoying. I have AP classes and they're annoying, blah, blah, blah. So it's like, I want to get out of this. And mm -hmm. all they have to get out of this as like, you know, leverage points to get out of it are the stereotype stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that's like so many people who, like I, I have never, never found the people who do the appropriative stuff are ever bad people, ever. Like, and I, I say that there are some bad people in LARP, yeah, maybe a couple of them, but like, generally there are these people who are like, no, like, I just think dream catchers are so cool. Like, they're just so cool. I go on a long, long rant about dream catchers and other Ojibwe boy things, but dream catchers are so cool and I love them and they're meaningful to me. And wow, I've loved them my entire life and I can go play a character and their entire thing is dream catchers. Awesome. Wow. I'm escaping. And I'm, I'm creating kind of more importantly. So yeah, a hundred percent. It's just like, this is still a problem, but I, I feel for you. Like, <laughs> let's, let's try to make a better community so you don't hurt me while you're doing that. Yeah, this is actually funny. This is one of those situations where like, normally I don't have anything to contribute, but like, yes, as a very white person, I can speak to this. <laughs> so um, what I find in predominantly white spaces um, is that it's easy to be, and this is like, I wonder what it would be like to be a man because it's so easy to be the default when it comes to conversations about race. Like it's something that I've had to think through that I still have to think through that I catch myself doing 
all the time but in predominantly white spaces um i think because like i mean yeah you get like oh i'm x percent scottish and i'm x percent german and you know you know we we have like white culture and this is that we're interested in our ancestries and like what our 23 me is saying right uh, is that what that's called <laughs> ancestry.com um but i think um the the number one thing that you will hear from white people is i hear from other white people when we are talking about racism is i don't see you know i see everybody as an individual i take every person as an individual person and i think that that's really rooted in kind of the sense of like because i don't feel like i'm part of necessarily a default racial group even though i absolutely am like it's just the way that our culture is set up um it's really easy for me to think of myself as an individual and I, you know american culture is highly individualistic it's very much about personal fulfillment and what you want go and live your dreams and do what you have to do yeah and so i think it's really easy to look at everything around you and think about what does this do for me and you know i think that that's like a big ball of you know being raised in a white supremacist world yeah. And also being raised in a highly individualistic culture. And, but it also leads to like one thing that you talked about in your article I thought was so interesting was that it's really hard to write games or to play characters that bring your own experience in into a group that contains white people because you worry that you're giving implicit permission to take and yeah. use at will. And how how do you navigate that like that just seems like it'd be really hard <laughs> yeah and it's like I've it's I've floundered there too and luckily like I have um my partner Scott and my sister Samantha who are both I don't know Scott's asleep I was almost like you should come do this you should come do this but they're both like brilliant people um and I have like a, a community of other native people to help navigate this but it is hard um I think part of it is and this speaks to like um what Jason was saying Liz what you just said is like when I um a native person, I'm presenting myself as a native person, I know that I am partially acting like as a representative of my cultural group because we are communal. And like when I'm doing something and it reflects badly, it doesn't just reflect badly on me, it reflects badly on other people, some of whom are no longer kind of living in terms of how we think of it. And so like when I move into a LARP space, even though I'm like obviously an individual, I thought it was a good idea to go get a PhD, the most like thoroughly selfish thing you can do. Um, but like, I, I still like recognize that like, I'm not just an individual, particularly if I'm bringing like Ojibwe things to the forefront and presenting myself as an Anishinaabe person. Um, so like, we really think about that all the time. And like Scott and I have like gone back and forth on like, is this actually appropriate for us to bring in? And we've like, we've consulted with kind of like his the different kind of, um, tribal leadership and experts on like, what can we do here? Um, and yeah, it's it, the, the real worry is, am I giving by sharing part of myself? Am I giving people implicit permission? And it has happened because so like the big one we do, um, the biggest Ojibwe stuff is apparently cool and people don't realize that it's cool, like that it's Ojibwe. So like it, it's dream catchers and the Wendigo. <laughs> As I say, it's no longer winter, I feel like I can say it, but it's the Wendigo. Um, and like, you know, like Scott, I, I talk about him a lot because we go back and we go back and forth to stuff all the time, but like Scott grew up like a poor Ojibwe kid. He grew up like just off reservation, very poor family. And like, he lived the stories of the Wendigo. Like that was what kind of like were his bread and butter growing up as a kid. Um, and he kind of realized that over time, you know, Algernon Blackwood did like every Ojibwe person dirty um, by creating this kind of idea of the Wendigo as this like antlered skull monster that like the Cthulhu mythos eventually, you know, the, I mean the, the later one, not the Lovecraft one, but like the like pop culture Cthulhu picked up and like you see it everywhere. And like Wendigo is, I don't know why, but it is like the thing um, people appropriate in LARP and like fantasy settings. And like, so we, this is a good example of, we were like, we really want to do something here because the Wendigo um, is such a powerful like piece of our culture. And it really like, it's kind of, it, it does speak to like the dangers of being individualistic and the dangers of, you know, yada, yada, but it's also a good, a good metaphor for colonialism. 
And we like actually consulted with people because we weren't sure if we should. And what we found out is like, no, just don't go, don't go in there saying like when to go, especially if you're running LARPs in the winter, you fools. Um, but like, go ahead and like talk about like an analogy. So we use like the starving man and we used it to talk about like colonialism and hunger and poverty and desperation. And it was a really, really cool. I don't think I talked about that in this article. Maybe I do. Um, but it was a really cool way to like, I've got a lot of irons on the fire. <laughs> some of most of them half finished um but it was this really cool way to be like okay here's like something that's appropriated we're gonna take it and change it into something else that is clearly inspired by and informed by and is the same story but it's different and what happened is we saw some other like game runners were watching this and they were like okay cool cool so we can totally not do the wendigo and just do something inspired by the wendigo like they did and they've given us permission to do this and we were like no, no, that wasn't what we wanted. Like that wasn't it at all. And like, we didn't, we confronted them on it. And like, they truly, they truly were like, but like, but you, you did it. You weren't like allowed to use the actual W word. So like you, you, you made the starving man. So we did the same thing because we're not, and we're like, yeah, but you're missing kind of, and that's with cultural appropriation. People are like, okay, if I'm not taking it whole cloth, it's fine. And I'm giving like, so if I'm, I'm just kind of like, if I'm shifting it, it's fine. Um, so I think that's one of my big worries. The other kind of worry I have is I have like a ton of skin privilege. People don't necessarily, they may, they usually just assume I'm Jewish. They may assume that I'm like mixed something, but they usually don't pin me as native unless they're native. Um, so when I'm playing like a native person in a game or I'm talking about native things, like as a game runner, um, I worry that I give people who are white and not mixed permission to do the same. And it's kind of, um, I, how I navigate that is it is better for me to give, uh, to build space for native people than it is for me to like overly worry about people stealing that identity because they're going to steal it anyways. And if they're in my games and playing it or seeing me do it, I feel like we at least have like a, a connection. I'd rather build space for, for people who are underrepresented, but it is a worry and it's happened and it always makes me feel like, Ugh. <laughs> makes me feel gross uh yeah so I guess this always leads back around right and you know you talked about your own past as a weeb um what happens <laughs> when you really feel like you're connecting with something from another culture and maybe you want to do something with it like in your article you mentioned that you know you define uh cultural appropriation partially it's just sort of taking something in an unequal power balance partially taking something without permission how do you get permission what does that mean and you know how do you you know, let's, how do you, how do you connect with something that you feel like you really relate to, but it's not from your culture in a way that's respectful? Um, or do you just have to let it go? Yeah, I think there's a certain amount of having to let it go. And I think that that's, that's something that is really phenomenally um, hard for people. And it's like, so I'll use my own, my own thing here. Like, um, I studied Japanese. I lived in Japan. My dissertation was on Japan. Uh, and I, I loved it. My ability to be in Japan is partially because of American wartime occupation. It's partially because of, you know, like um, the West, so-called West came in to Japan in the late 19th century. And it's then because there was this awful occupation of Japan we never talk about um, following World War II. Uh, and so my ability to study Japan, even though I have many, many Japanese friends who love like sharing their culture with me and stuff like that, it's still there are power imbalances as an American that I just have access to that. Um, and it's something that I just have to think about is, you know, I think Japan is one of now the soft power empires, uh, but still it's, it's my access to it is not without, um, is not without bloodshed, like quite literally. And I think when people are really like, I really appreciate this culture and I love it so much and I want to connect. It's like, you can connect. That's cool. And I'll, I'll go to like, kind of, there are ethical ways to do that. Um, but you do have to understand that there are historical power imbalances where people died and people were traumatized and people were hurt. And I think that that's really painful is, you know, Scott talks about this a lot is like, yeah, people like really may love Native American culture and they really maybe want to badly be indigenous, which is a whole nother conversation about why people want to be Native, but they really badly want that. And he's like, yeah, but like, you know, I have an aunt who's a residential school survivor um, and like I live with that reality. She lives with that reality. That's not, you may really connect with the culture, but you're 
not actually feeling kind of the historical weight of that because you have not been violated by it. So I think there's a little bit of letting go that you're ever going to engage in imbalance, like power dynamic cultural exchange without feeling a little bad. Cause you should feel a little bad. Like we should all feel a little bad <laughs> that we can take things from other people. Um, that being said, um, cultural exchange this is for all the people who are like, it's appreciation, not appropriation. Cultural exchange can be really beautiful and really powerful. And like, I know, like I, I love bringing my non-native friends to powwows. That's a good example. And we have like a pretty like lively powwow circuit in the Northeast, but I love bringing my non-native friends and my non-native students um, to powwows. And like, cause I'm just like, look at how cool this is. Like, look at the cool stuff we do. And like, let me show you how to engage with the space. Here's when it's appropriate for you to engage in this way. This is what it's appropriate for you to wear or say or do. Um, you know, like as a Jew, I love like when like Rosh Hashanah is my favorite like Jewish holiday and like no Rosh Hashanah gets no play and it's so fun. And I love having like non-Jews cause I like cooking for them and sharing with them and talking about it and doing like, you know, the people generally, if they're not Jewish, they haven't seen Rosh Hashanah. Um, and one of the ways is just ask, like, just ask, like Liz, you were talking about, like, you always wonder, like, if you're going to like email someone, Hey, you want to do an interview? Might as well ask. Like, <laughs> but it's like, just ask and find people to talk to you. Um, I think with the native community right now, we are across the board in like a moment of real protection of what is ours. And that is not because we hate non-native people. It's because so much of it has been taken and stolen. But like, if people really connect with a culture, go find cultural experts who are of that culture and just talk with them about it and like read books written by people of that culture, watch movies um, and do so without making it yours. My sister and I were talking about this when Encanto came out. Um, Encanto was an amazing movie for so many reasons. And we were like, you know, it's, it's kind of too bad because we watched after it and like so many, so many people resonated with it. Um, and a bunch of little girls all wanted to dress like Mirabelle. And they wanted like the costume and the stuff like that. And my sister and I were like, this is a really fascinating moment because we should really maybe just be teaching our kids. You can love something and it can resonate with you and you can feel the emotions without wanting to take to Jason's point, the consumable stuff. And like, maybe it's not, it's not bad that kids want to do cultural exchange, but like, where do we kind of like as adults go, how can we have this conversation in a cool way that really lets them resonate with and engage with culture in a way that they're not taking it and trying to make it them. Um, and I think it, like when you bring up kids, people get like really, they're like, you know, they're just kids. They don't know any better, whatever. If they want to dress like Moana, they can dress like Moana. It's like, yes. And yes. And right. like, how do we really encourage, encourage, everybody to kind of think a little more expansively of like, I can empathize and love something without making it mine. I think I love the way you ended there in terms of, you know, like someone will hear this conversation. They'll think like, well, I just, you're telling me not to do it. You're telling me not to do cultural appreciation. You're trying to ban and cancel. You're trying to do whatever, whatever. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I love Encanto. <laughs> and, my kids, like, and my, and my daughter, she's six years old. She has an entire, uh, she has Pocahontas dress. She has Moana dress, but she has all the things. And like, you can get in like, you know, Pocahontas, please. I mean, <laughs> oh my. Uh, anyway, so like, I guess the answer, like, to, to jump off your yes and, which is beautiful, um, resist reductionism. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, let's say that someone wants to get the encanto dress, or someone wants to use a dream catcher, or someone wants to like be empowered by a Wendigo, uh, or and this actually came up a completely different um, context. So Thor right? The, the, the God of thunder. And it's like, we know Thor, he's like a big blonde muscular guy and whatever. And then the, uh, the game maker God of war, they recently like kind of did a version of Thor in their thing. He was like this big fat bl uh, brown head slob. I was like, what? That's not <laughs> Thor. And it's like, wait a minute, that is more Thor than what y'all have. So what that did was it took a cultural symbol and it, it resisted the reductionism like okay like this cultural symbol of like you know god of thunder and vikings and everything it's more than one thing this dream yeah. is more than one thing this dress is more than one thing and i think we would do really well uh you know both as you know the nice white, white moderate larper and also you know those of us who are uh, poc marginalized educating folks to be like it's not about banning it's mm -hmm. about enriching yes and 
Like, okay, you understand it as this. You've taken Wendigo and you've gotten like the, you know, the deal with the devil and the winter and all that kind of stuff. You've gotten that. Now let's try to open up. You've eaten the Taco yeah. Bell. Let me yeah. show you what a real arepa is like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I'm not telling you to stop eating Taco Bell, but I'm saying, please don't stop at Taco Bell. Yeah. Please yeah. don't stop there. Let Yes, and let's keep going. I love that. Yeah. And it's, um, because I was talking about this, like we talked about this, one of the most profoundly wonderful things about being a native person who runs games for like, you know, it's like by and for like the like dozen indigenous people who actually LARP in this area. But like, we like, we're like trying to be like native first. It's like one of the things is like, we're like, God, it's so nice to play native villains, just normal people who are bad people. Like we can like, the idea, because there's this really big thing with like, you know, representation is if you have a native character in a movie and it's a woke movie, they have to be a good person because you don't want to be racist, which I get, like, I totally understand. And like, when you really do like this, yes, and let's enrich is like, oh my God, we can have more complicated stories than um, just, yeah, like these, these reductive narratives. And it's the same. Well, I'm saying like the evil shaman that is like throwing voodoo in there for like, that becomes like the, the stereotypical native enemy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, and it's, it's also just like, that's the other one is like, so it's also, I think the foot, like when you get to like cringy stuff is like all of the different racial groups get thrown together as like the villain. So it, it like, I, I am laughing cause I'm like, yep. Voodoo shaman who is also a Wendigo and like, there's something about day of the dead in there. Where did that come in? Whatever. Okay. But like, everything gets lumped together and then there's viking stuff too all right like it's it's bizarre um and i i do think it's like the vast majority of us who are proud of our culture regardless of what it is want to share it i have some very good friends in larping who are very very scottish they're scottish american they're scottish american to the day they die and they love talking about scotland I don't understand what they're talking about half the time, but they love talking about Scotland and they want to share it. And I think it's the same, like from marginalized groups, it's like, we do do like, we like talking about it. Like I, you know, like my, one of my love languages is making food. And I've, um, for a couple of the LARPs I've run for the dinner, like I've just catered the dinner as like a native feast. Like, this is what we eat. Like it was, um, one Thanksgiving, we decided that we don't really do Thanksgiving because uh, we're native. Uh, and we just wanted to do like, we're like, why don't we just LARP? Like, why don't we just throw a LARP? And what we will throw for people is we will do like, we will do an education on the National Day of Mourning and um, the violence is connected to Thanksgiving, but we'll have a fun LARP and out of game for dinner. I'll give, I'll, I'll pull everybody out of game for dinner and I'll do a mini lecture and I'll make people really, really good food and share it. And like, they're going to get to taste stuff that they don't like necessarily beyond like, you know, pumpkin or <laughs> bison. And it was so fun. And like people, and then people were like, this was so good. Can I have the recipe for this? I was like, absolutely. And when you make it, tell people it's Ojibwe, <laughs> like, and tell people it's specifically from like this area in Michigan or whatever. And that's like where you can do it. Like, and I, I talk about food, which I think is kind of an easy, it's like a, it's an easy one to talk about, but like, you can absolutely do it and just go beyond this sort of exactly like reductive idea of what it is to be any one thing. So I want to pick up on the idea of reduction because um, it's actually something that came up in your article as well. And I think actually in the context of religion and, you know, I think most people see their own religious experiences as quite rich and nuanced, but one of the hallmarks of something being culturally appropriated is that it's flat. It's been flattened. Um, and when people express horror at your version of something that is from their culture, a lot of times it's because you took all the flavor out and just yeah. made it flat. So, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> is that a general trend, you know, that you've just seen outside of this article? Is that is that part of the issue? I just think it's, it's and you know, Jason, one of your big taglines too is don't be reductive. And I feel like if you're going to take a lesson from y'all, that's a good one. Yeah. So one of the, and this is easy. This is easy in LARP. And this is sort of my sister's, my sister's whole thing. She's, my sister's a badass. So you should definitely interview at some point. But what she really looks at is like the material reality of LARP. And she looks at it more like kind of in like the commercial 
market of LARP and uh, how this like, you know, like touchy, touchy feely thing has become like supremely expensive and the barriers to access. But one of the things when people are LARPing anything is they need material manifestation of it unless they're doing like a real experimental black box uh, sort of thing. Um, but people, if they are appropriating native identity or something like it, will use like physical props and they'll have like all of these props, some of which they've made, some of which they've purchased, which is like another thing, uh, some of which they've made, made, purchased, like dreamed up and they will create their religious spaces. And I think I talk about this with both Brian and um, Jennifer is they'll have these beautiful LARP spaces, but they've reduced all of native religion down to objects. And that's so, while um, like as somebody who works in material studies, objects are phenomenally important. Um, and sometimes objects are not, they are living and animate uh, in our cultures. Um, we're not just objects. There are decades and decades of experience behind those. There are permissions you need to get to use certain things. They work in concert with one another. They're part of outside practices. Um, and they don't, yeah, they don't just kind of, it, when you just have like a material manifestation, it's a really good example of that. And like props and like the culture of props and costuming is really where it gets reductive. Um, the other one, and so that's like one, and I think it's something that it's it's hard to, because when you're trying to very quickly in like a two, three day event, like very quickly communicate, I am a person of this cultural background, even if it's fantastical, like props and costuming are what you use. Um but it's, it, we need to kind of like look at like, how are we just being like materialistic consumers by communicating identity through objects? In what ways is that powerful? And in what ways is that severely limiting um, and even damaging? The other one is, we talked about this at I think the beginning of this, but there is this sort of like assumption of like pan-Indian religion, that we all believe the same things, that we all like, one, like I've talked so many times about like, I'm a Jew. I am deeply connected to both my Jewish, her Jewish heritage and my Anishinaabe heritage. They go together, um, which means I have like kind of this complicated religious life that I have to negotiate in a way that has tensions. And that's like every other native person I know. We don't have this kind of like cookie. Not only do we have different tribal experiences and different tribal um, lives and cultural backgrounds, but we also have phenomenally individual like experiences of religion and culture. And when that comes into a LARP and it's just, yes, we've always believed in the ancestors and we pray to the great wolf spirit and the great wolf spirit empowers us for battle. That's just so <laughs> sad. There's so much more there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Comes to like resistance, right? I mean, the story of being a depressed person is every part of your life is some sort of field of resistance, right? So there's a resistance of reductionism. And when you know, for Liz's question about religion, like I think people want to make religion comfortable. And like, you know, we're gonna yeah. take the religion that make us comfortable. So it's like Christianity, theoretically, when it was first founded, and I'm a, I'm a Catholic, uh, it was founded as this like radical, revolutionary, let's reorder society, let's reorder the way we relate to another, one another. And then you go through the grist in the mill of the dominant culture and it becomes like, okay, an hour on Sunday mm -hmm. or um, APEC Catholics, so like Ash Wednesday, Palm Sunday, Easter, Christmas. Like that's what I'm Catholic. And then it doesn't impede upon the rest of my life, which I want, I want that to be comfortable. So that religion could go over here. And I think figuring out ways of whatever, and every, I think every religious tradition can do this. If you dive deep enough into it, like it can challenge the way we are. Every religion can challenge. So like, I, I think of, um, you know, a, a native um, aspect to it, like, you know, pan native or whatever, but like, I think there's a, a relationship there where about land and property. So it's like, you know, a, a native person is likely to not think about land in the same way as, uh, you know, a person from a Western culture. Western culture, mm -hmm. it's all about like, okay, property deeds, I have a piece of paper and I have like, a, that, that gives me title to this land. And that just doesn't make any sense in the context of, you know, um, wherever. So it's like, you know, like a, a native person wouldn't say, okay, let me go back to my house, my 2.5 kids, my white fence. Like, you know, the white fence doesn't exist as like this demarcation of like, if you cross this thing, then we're going to shoot you. Like, that's not, you know, that's, 
that's a whole different way of seeing this one thing. So it's like, how can I in my LARP or in my RPG or in my game, like not just bring in the thing, the TP or whatever it is, like bring in the actual conception that might challenge my preconceived notion mm -hmm. of what property is and what land, land is. So it's like, uh, I go back to your like really striking thing of like, uh, you know, you don't belong here. Well, I, that's a very propertyed version. Yeah. Uh, and so you see like, even in that, like that resist, like you don't belong here, that like, you know, uh, that's a, where is here? What does here mean? You know, and, and like, uh, obviously there's sacred spaces in like, you know, in your tradition too, but it, it doesn't play out that same way. And to be yeah. honest, on a second, let's, let's, and that sounds really weird. Let's question here. <laughs> But really, we have to like, we have to rethink like the the fundamental stuff, you know, yeah. the fundamental idea of property, the fundamental idea of what symbols are and how symbols function. Symbols don't just function for comfort. And if symbols should be able to challenge and transform, and and if they're not, then we have to really rethink what we're doing. Yeah, no, completely. Um, and I have some. So this is kind of like again, not my experience, but I have some uh, black friends who are larpers, who are really challenging, like no more slave races in games, none. Not in the American context, none. And that sounds really basic, like slave slave races shouldn't exist. And they've gone a step further. It's like, no more slavery in American games, none, none, unless a black person's running it. You can't, you can't have it here. And there's been a lot of resistance there because people, a very common thing, it's like you hear like, yeah, it's probably not a great idea to have like, you know, a house elf slave race, like that, that sounds bad. But then people go, but like, but wait, what if I'm playing an escaped slave who's living the tragedy and trauma of an escaped slave? And like a lot of my like black LARPer friends will be like, just don't, just don't. We can talk, we can have black voices lead this conversation. We can have meaningful um, inclusion of histories of slavery, even if it's not Americans uh, like chattel slavery, we can have that. But in the American context, it is hurtful to people and it's generally not contextualized well. And like, how do we move away from, from that? And I think that people get like, so, um, I don't know, they get so defensive about the experience they want to have versus listening to other voices. Um, but yeah, I think of like, uh, like the property, like understanding property and land. And like, what I really think of is just like understanding community permission. Like in one of our games, After Dark, which has been on hiatus because of COVID and hopefully comes back, but After Dark is kind of like, it is my love letter to New England. Um, and Scott and I have worked on it a lot together to like bring in like actual native characters, like as our, we play them. Like it's like, you know, <laughs> they all look like Zoe or Scott. Um, but like we play them, but like one of the things that we have in the background is like the players will ask one of like the the Ojibwe characters because they're all they're all representative of our tribal um, backgrounds. They'll ask one of the characters, oh, like, can we do X, Y, Z thing? Because they want to go do some new adventure. And we'll be like, oh, we have to go ask the others. And it's like there's it's kind of this on running joke that they're always going to ask like the other native people because they're like a community because that's how we think and operate. And that's something that like my non-native players find it like really funny but I think they're also learning about like how decision-making happens in like more of a tribal realm is that it is communal and collective. And like my native players think it's wildly funny that it takes, cause they get it. They're familiar with it. They, but they're like, Oh man, it's so funny. Cause it takes them so long. Cause they have to go ask everybody's opinion. Um, and it's just stuff like that. It's like challenging. Like how do we think about how people live their lives? Even so basic down is like, Oh, ugh, I don't know if you can actually go do that. Let me go ask everybody else. Well, we, you know, um, I've seen some, like, you know, I'm familiar with the Jewish context, but I've seen, like, Jewish players do similar things in, like, modern games. Um, I do find, this is this is a tangent, but I do find modern games to be where we can actually make meaningful progress because they're the most difficult. Because if you have a modern game, even if it's set in, like, a fictional world, because they're all fictional worlds, but if you have a modern game, you really have to grapple with a lot of the very uncomfortable issues that fantasy games kind of mask. And it's so, like fantasy games you can do things so subtly and it can be so subtle and sometimes not subtly racist like if you have some guy like i've seen i've seen uh in 2011 there was just some some white guy in a war bonnet like running around in a high fantasy game it was very confusing and the gm to his credit kicked him out so like it was weird um but 
fantasy games are so subtle. Like, and a lot of times it's like, you're like, wait, what's the problem with elves? Like, why are elves a problem? Like, so now we can't even play elves. Um, but modern games are really where sort of that mask comes off and people go and play them and they go, oh, that's the problem with elves. Oh, I get it. Oh. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done there. And I think that they're exciting. And I, I don't think that they were really popular. So before COVID, like modern LARPs were super popular and there was this huge, like all these different people were running them and then COVID hit and people went, we don't, we don't want to play in the modern world anymore. Can we go back to fantasy land? So I'm bummed about it, but that's a side point. Oh, no. All right. I'm going to switch all off on one potential run more before I start to wrap this up, but Jason, this is a favorite topic of yours. And I actually think it's what I was trying to talk about earlier and I like, remembered. So I think when we talk about things being flat, the other thing, the, I think one of the reasons that happens is that um, a lot of things that white people bother, borrow from other cultures, uh, we borrow from history. History kind of seems like it's dead, like it's not here anymore. Like it's something that's just in the past, we can just go pick it up and play with it because there's nobody out there who's still playing with it and you know, it's something that we've talked about in historical games primarily on this podcast but i think that that also kind of comes back around to these discussions of religion and shamanism and like if you don't know someone who's doing traditional beliefs it might seem to you like you can just pick it up because like nobody's really doing that so like my version will be fine um but these things are alive and other people are practicing them and you know, just because it's not something that's part of your experience doesn't mean that it's not a modern living experience. Yeah. Um, so there are, yes, um, I think that's part of it. There are a couple, <laughs> I have like a billion ideas firing off my head. So one of it is like, and I'll, I'll speak to like the native identity um, specifically, but one of it is like that one of the great racist tropes in American literature is this idea of the vanishing native. It's like that we're not here anymore. Like it's that indigenous people, it's so sad they're gone. So we have to carry on their beliefs for them. And that like, oh my God, that really comes forward. There's a new thing in LARP right now to play like at King Philip's war, uh, in the Northeast and side point, but it's like where people look, it's like, we are still existing with indigenous people with the ramifications of King Philip's War. Uh, and like, it's not, we still exist, we are still here. That's almost become kind of like a cliche at, at this point. Um, but there's this idea that native people just aren't really real anymore. And I think a lot of the people who want to explore these themes and go, oh, we can do a historical setting because it's not gonna hurt anybody, really don't think about that. The other thing is there's this great book by Mark Rifkin called Beyond Settler Time, which really, challenges and I think is at the root of like a lot of indigenous thought right now it challenges this idea that history is linear because we don't see history as like a lot of indigenous groups in the Turtle Island area we don't see history as linear like we it's more cyclic or it's more kind of it's more uh multi-temporal and this book is great um for people just to understand a completely different sort of thought around time and it's why when we hear, like when people talk about generational trauma and the idea that the trauma of generations before you is carried in your body and no, it's not like a past lives thing. It's that if things happen to your ancestors, you are still experiencing them is such a, it's like a controversial concept in indigenous communities sometimes, but is a powerful part, uh, part I think of indigenous thought um, is that we do not exist separate from our histories. And I think anybody can understand that regardless if they're um, from a minoritized community or not is we don't exist separate from our histories um but what my sister and I talk about a lot is like it's so weird that like I'll, I'll say non-native people but it's so weird that like non-native people really see like kind of like history as this like linear thing that they can march through and they can go back and pick up chunks to play with and put back whereas like we kind of feel like we are responsible for all of our histories. And it's like, if you want to like, if you want a fascinating look at like a really complicated ancestry tree and like understandings of like, you know, kind of like ancestor work or like lineage work is like talk to a mixed race native person because we have just as many like racists and white supremacists in our family tree as we do uh, like native people. And we often like, I think a lot of it is talking about like, how are we responsible for time and how are we responsible for history and how do we carry it together? This is all to like, kind of like, 
wrap up and say that from an indigenous perspective is you can't history isn't like safe <laughs> in fact like sometimes it's the most like um it's it's one of the most dangerous things to look at because like we're people existing now in spite of history and we still kind of carry it forward with us I think we're speaking to Liz's thing. Like when we talk about, and I'll get, uh, if I haven't gotten in trouble with the white people, I'm going to get in trouble with white people now. Uh, the idea of um, like whiteness, like inherent in the idea of whiteness is the idea of forgetting. And um, the idea like, okay, so you mentioned before, like the vanishing native, uh, James Fenimore Cooper, last more Mohicans. And, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, it ended at Wounded Knee, like 1890s. Like that's the last that we've heard significantly from Native Americans. In the last hundred years, there there have been none of y'all. Uh, or like, it's all been in the past. And like, we forget, because we want to, because we need to, that they didn't just vanish, killed them. Yeah. And like, what the, the idea being that like, built in like and it's not just natives it's like you know, all over the place so it's like I, I remember reading a podcast about like okay when the whole settler project that began in 1492 it went in just start new like it like there were muslims in spain the moors and like they just took what they tried to do to make new spain and erase the moors and they transferred it over here so it's like we're talking like uh, like peoples like you know marginalized peoples all across the board and you have a culture that wants to forget and be comfortable and just mm -hmm. wants to make it about the here and now and how do you do that you take the difficult stuff and you chop it up and you commoditize it and, and do whatever but that's great if you're in that culture in these marginalized cultures I, I think what you're saying is like we physically, psychically can't. Yeah, like that. It, it, it's, a, it's an impossibility. So it's like I get all these comments. Okay, it's just the game and enjoy the game. I, I can't, and it's such a hard thing to explain to somebody in that comfortable bubble because they're so used to, well, you know, forgetting as a way of well, not even forgetting because it's not even there for them but like resisting any attempt to kind of incorporate that into a sense of self. Oh, you're, you, you got here because of genocide. You got here because of killing. You got here because of exclusion. That wasn't me. That happened in the past. Well, I'm here because of that. I'm here because of uh, like my life, and my, you know, people's lives are shaped by those activities. I can't forget that. I, I, I might as well try to cut off my arm, which I'm not going to do. Um, <laughs> so it's so this like cultural, like, this, this bridging that divide is, is just a lot harder because not only are we just like trying to figure out which cultural forms are translatable or whatever, just like the basic conception of how, of, of what history is, uh, how constitutive it is to our identity is, that's a huge divide. Yeah. And I think, I think you really nailed it with the culture of forgetting and like whiteness, particularly in white America is like, why, why would people want to remember that? Like the, why I, I get it. Like I, why would you want to think about like things that, um, your ancestors have done? Mine certainly have. I have horrifically evil people. They are just as much a part of me as like, you know, the native people who may have been good. I don't know. I'm very proud of my native ancestry. Um, but it's, it is a culture of forgetting. And I think in a fantasy space, or a fictional space or whatever, but this embodied play space is we often think of it as a space of creating. And it's, it can be, but it can also be a space of forgetting if you're creating new narratives that you put on top of things that happened. And if suddenly you're like washing away, if you're like, it's just a game, like it, it's not just a game. And like maybe empower the game a little bit more. It's a game constructed in this rich cultural landscape of people with competing histories and competing agendas and whatever. It's not just a game. It's um, a manifestation of how we live our cultural lives. And I think kind of my, my big pitch here is people, not every game you go to has to be super woke, has to be super progressive, has to be subversive. Like for the love of God, I like just going and playing games sometimes. There, right. I like when it's just a game too. Punishment, not just worked. But um, instead of it's like in our spaces, instead of contributing to this like culture of forgetting, why not try to create a better collective memory? And why not use games as a space where people can bring kind of the tensions and the controversies of the real world into them um, in a safe 
in a safe way that supports diverse voices and recognizes that we do do a lot of work in our day-to-day lives to forget the past. And again, like I, I talk about um, the United States specifically because it's such a rich space to play in because we have this horrific history that has so much to it. And like Americans, however we define ourselves, you know, um, we're weird people. Like we're weird people who've done weird things globally, um, who continue to in- advance like violence globally. And it's like, we are so lucky that we have these spaces in this country to play and we can use play as something productive and we can use play as a way not to forget, but instead to investigate and engage and build like an ethical collective memory. Right. And I think like you mentioned that dirty word, woke. <laughs> woke. <laughs> and, woke, woke. Uh, uh, <laughs> word plagues my brain. So it's like, I think um, when I say stuff like, okay, the white, I'm going to get in trouble with the white people, like people automatically judge that I'm going to say something super woke. And for me, like wokeness is inherently negative or inherently is, is inherently about blaming, shaming, like, okay, uh, we're going to talk about like Thanksgiving as the, the genocide of native peoples to make people feel bad about Thanksgiving. You know, I don't want you to have turkey. I don't want you to enjoy stuff. And like, that's not why we want to remember stuff, right? I, I, we don't want to just remember stuff to make y'all feel bad. That, that's not the point at all. Uh, I, I want to play games too. Like, just like, uh, um, just like you said, that's amazing. Um, the idea being like, after 1890, like, which was kind of the nadir of native population in America, like the native population did nothing but grow again. And now what's the population now? What are y'all over a million? Uh, yeah, you know, and people are tribes and all, and if you count mixed rapes as well. So it's like, you, you can't even, you, when you forget the, the genocide and the death, mm-hmm. we, we stop ourselves from telling the story of rebirth. The end of the day, when we, when we talk about like, cultural like culturally resonant i don't like sensitive because people whatever culturally resonant larps and rpgs and games i want to tell about the story of not just the death and the genocide and brutality but the resistance and the rebirth and we can't tell the story properly if we don't adequately remember because if we tell a story of rebirth and resistance without that cultural memory then it becomes the individual's rebirth mm-hmm. and that's cool, <laughs> sort of. But then when you tell the individual story of rebirth, then we start to, you know, kind of play at that cultural stuff. And it's like, no, 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 just, just do the, just go for the whole shebang for me. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it kind of, I guess, um, it's this idea of futurity too, right? And it's like the one thing like I think um, is like, man, as a native kid, how cool would it have been if I could go read like RPG books where I got to be native or how cool would be, I got to play as like a native kid and my background and culture was just as important as, you know, the guy who really is, is big into Vikings or whatever, or like, and, or the, the kid who's super, super into like Arthurian legends. And that's where I think of like, when, like, I look at we as adults is like, what's our responsibility here? Our responsibility is really to try to move this in like towards rebirth and resistance and revitalization. Like all those are words um, because like there are kids and like we all kind of, we're having these conversations uh, regardless of what our identity is because as kids, like something was formative. We still play games because it was formative as a child to be able to engage in that space. And like, we owe it to the kids. And it's like, I, I got like a, a kiddo. Like it's, I, I get so excited when she has access to her, um, cultural world. So yeah, I'm, I'm like, think of the children, but like actually think of the children, not think of the children. Cause you don't want to talk about problematic things. <laughs> <laughs> so history is not a safe space, but also you still have to go there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Zoe, um, why don't you just, why don't you just give us a quick rundown of, you know, any interesting projects you're working on now and where people can find you online. Yeah, so you can find me at Red Rabbit LARP Productions or Red Rabbit Productions. God, I don't even know my own thing. Um, Red Rabbit Productions. Uh, you can look up Zoe Eddy. I'm all over the place. Uh, I, I am right now, I'm looking at a pretty, I'm starting a new project on LARP, looking about uh, looking at militarizing pleasure and military play in LARP. And it's super cool and like how people understand war games and the 
problems and potential therein. I also, my other great love is looking at a native baby Yoda and the native baby Yoda phenomenon and how indigenous communities are claiming the Mandalorian as their own to look at uh, stories of resistance and childhood and risk. And some, and I teach kids a lot. <laughs> and I teach my awesome students. They're not children. I'm going to tell them to listen to this because uh, they were excited I was going to be on a podcast about gaming. My amazing students at WPI, I teach them a bunch. They're great. That's pretty much me. <laughs> <laughs> sure uh, you can find me at shelf stories a uh, youtube channel shelf stories gbl uh the big project that i have working on right now is called the case files which was birthed here on uh beyond solitaire the first time i mentioned the case files was here on this podcast so i'm happy to uh to share that i've in- i've put up an intro video defining terms appropriation versus pre- appreciation stereotyping and erasure uh, all the things we talked about today i, I try to like boil it down into a 20 minute dictionary level. What are these things? What do we mean? And then I've applied them at this point to two different games. I've applied it to the Lost Ruins of Arnak, speaking of vanishing native and erasure, that kind of thing. And I've applied it to Lewis Park. And uh, you know, uh, in terms of the native as friendly and hey, here, uh, you know, we're gonna help the core of discovery just go through the land and give them all stuff for free. That did not happen. Uh, so, I'm trying to, you know, take this and pay it forward uh, into the individual little products. And I'm doing that on my channel, Shelf Story, Shelf Story GBL on Twitter. Uh, please come along for the ride. Fantastic. And if you're listening to this podcast, you probably know, but just in case you don't, I can be found anywhere as Beyond Solitaire. So I thank you so much for coming on this podcast. This was great. I really Miigwech. appreciate this conversation. Yeah, miigwech. Thank you in a good way. But this has been great. Thank you. Fantastic. And uh, thanks, Jason, for coming along. And for everybody else out there, Happy gaming. Later, everybody.